And I am glad you're here today for my conversation that we've labeled the Pyramid Insight Hour. And today, uh, we're going to talk about a particular topic that actually has been near and dear to me for quite some time um, as it relates to working in talent management inside of organizations. I, in fact, when Bob Eichinger and I started this, this work, where we were creating uh, libraries to look at roles and practices. Uh, one of the things that I expressed to Bob early on was that it was time that we paid attention to individual contributors because individual contributors, as you'll see from some of the information I'm going to share, are often the most ignored uh, groups and organizations. They get, uh, at best, the dashing of, of training, onboarding, um, maybe a little bit of uh, e-learning opportunities and occasionally some special issues related to uh, uh, the organization itself. Those of you who know me know that I've been uh, working in the talent management space in a variety of roles. Um, I have been a coach. I've been obviously a facilitator, and of course, uh, I have actually been the chief uh, people person for a financial services company for a number of years, and quite enjoyed um, that particular role and those particular responsibilities. Today, when we get into this conversation on, on uh, looking at uh, our individual contributors, um, just so you know, our typical pattern and our typical way of approaching the work that we've done is to, to ask the question, what are all the relevant data pieces that we want to share? Um, what are the particular trends and patterns within those data pieces? Um, how do we choose to analyze that? What's the particular evidence suggesting to us? And what are the consequences of the findings that we have that we'll want to make sure and uh, make available to people. When we started all of our library work, and in no less true with individual contributors, uh, we, we took a look at what was available through key referee journals and other sources. There were a variety of white papers on individual contributors. And um, I would say, in general, if you try to look at hard and fast research on individual contributors, um, the research is rare compared to what we find on leaders or managers. And it would be my proposition that, um, in fact, as we get through the COVID-19 event, uh, we're likely to find that the attention to individual contributors may need to be even more important in order to achieve the kinds of things enterprises need to achieve. Now, we know that individual contributors may come into an organization at any number of levels. Um, they may be uh, there we in go. individuals who uh, come in at the, at, right after college with certain expertise. Um, they may be individuals who are sought or recruited uh, for particular expertise that they have years of experience and they're put in sort of a professional uh, seat in the organization. And they don't necessarily expect to take over what we might think of as managerial roles or managerial areas of responsibility. So <clears throat> we, we know at a minimum that individual contributors have technical skills that the enterprise highly values and that, in fact, those technical skills um, are essential to the organization achieving uh, its particular goals and business objectives. There have been a variety of uh, um, reports about individual contributors uh, in Forbes in 2014. Uh, there was an article entitled, Individual Contributors Are the Forgotten Leaders. And um, the, there was a good look at, uh, in fact, the question of you know, what kind of attention is being paid to individual contributors and how are individual contributors 
re encouraged and reinforced in, in enterprise life. In a number of other studies, uh, this came out of uh, I believe Training Magazine. Um, there were a number of findings where when managers and execs were asked about their employees, especially the individual contributors, the general feeling was that they're not necessarily skilled as they need to be to be effective inside of the enterprise per se, um, that they show up <clears throat> missing certain skills that will be vital and important. And that in fact, uh, this issue is uh, going to impact the productivity uh, of organizations and enterprises, which would imply that we do a lot better uh, in our organizational life if we spent some attention and resources on uh, how to help individual contributors be successful. If you have read a variety of studies on millennials at work, you know um, that any number of them come into the workplace expecting opportunities uh, to stretch and to grow and to have authority. Um, and that's a, a part of the sort of worker expectation we're seeing that individual contributors are bringing to the workplace. In a variety of studies, um, questions, this involved thousands of employees across all kinds of industries in these countries. Um, what do you think the skills, do you think the skills are going to change related to your job? And as you can see, overwhelmingly, the vast majority of people feel that the skill changes are going to be coming their way. And to the question, do you think automation is going to impact your work? A large number of people feel that that's true, which would mean then they have time available um, and energy available to do other things. And so to the question, then, well, given that you expect things to change, given that you expect automation to take over a portion of your work, um, do you think that you would leave your job if your employer doesn't provide training? As you can see, again, the majority of people who answered the question said uh, yes, in fact, that they would. So then naturally the question comes, well, how are we doing in terms of the expenditure allocations uh, that we are uh, investing in an in enterprise? And this came out of Training Magazine where they annually do a report on what monies are being spent and uh, how it's distributed. And of course, while there will be some individual contributors um, in a, what we might call a middle level role in the organization, the vast majority of them um, are folks who uh, are on the lower end. And when you look at this percentage of allocation, you have to remember that the largest number of employees are in the non-exempt employee group. So if 39% of your training budget is going to that group, then when you start distributing that money over that group, it's really a relatively small investment. And one of the things I feel very strongly about, especially today, is that we have the knowledge to take a more surgical approach um, to our training with individual contributors and also identifying much earlier uh, and finding our high potentials. So if it is true that having people feel valued and having people uh, feel as though they have opportunities within the organization is going to be important, that there needs to be an opportunity to experience increased success, um, then we need to be more intentional about the ways in which we approach individual contributors. Now, part of the problem has been, until now anyway, part of the problem has been the, the material for individual contributors has been scattered about. It's been more, how do we onboard people? How do we help them be, um, understand the rules of the road in the organization? How do we, so it's treating them, if you will, um, as the new arrivals and the investment of time and energy and resources is about helping them understand how to use their skill and knowledge. And as good as that is, that's not sufficient. And part of the reason, again, that it's not been attended to is there hasn't been an answer to the question, well, 
what is it we need to be giving individual contributors to help them be successful, to help them feel that they can progress, to help them feel valued, and to help them develop those who want to um, and to be excellent managers. Well, one of the things that we've done at Team Intelligent is we, we stepped back and did a hard look at um, all organizations, <clears throat> regardless of size. We took a look at the research that tells us that there are three significant levels in organizational life. And one of those levels is individual contributors. And the world they live in is very, very different than the world the manager lives in or the folks at the top of the enterprise uh, lives in. And if you have any doubt about this, um, if you research uh, differences and expectations and differences in performance across organizational levels, you'll find a number of research pieces. On a hands-on example, for years and years, I've done a simulation that is sponsored by um, uh, folks out of Boston <clears throat> related to power and organizations. Uh, Barry Oshry is the guy who developed the SIM that's called the Organizational Workshop. And you have bottoms, middles, and tops. And in the organization, they are to uh, fulfill the responsibilities, bottoms, creating the material, the middles, doing the management between the tops and the bottoms and, and the, the top folks at the top doing their thing around strategy and culture. Every single time I've done this sim over the last 20 years, um, the managers and the executives who are in the, in the exercise will say when they've been assigned the bottom role, how much they had forgotten what it felt like to be an individual contributor and to not have the attention of the organization. And even though it was a sim, they felt uh, easily how they were the forgotten ones and that their resources and opportunities for them to contribute were being pushed against by the nature of the psychology of uh, the organization in the sim. Now, keep in mind, people weren't given defined roles. They were just simply told, you're a bottom in this organization, and here's what bottoms do. They, they create creative posters and things of that nature. Um, there was no uh, definitive, this is what your job description is. This is just the general role you play within the, the sim. The power of that sim, um, as I shared it with Bob, it, is that it helps people understand the distinctiveness of the psychological differences with people and the needs they have at the different levels of organizations. And in our stuff that Bob and I have created, the folks at the top of the enterprise, there are nine specific roles. The managers and supervisors have 11, and the individual contributors, 10 roles that we know are absolutely vital to be fulfilled. It's what people are measured against. It's how they succeed inside of the organization. And within each level, of course, their practices. The practices get at particular behaviors that, that, that if you will, they have varying importance to the roles and are to be fulfilled um, depending on various pressures in the organization and various expectations. But what is ubiquitous across organizational life is that the roles for where you are in the organization must be fulfilled if you're to be successful. And and today we're going to zero in on individual contributors and a couple of the things that I believe can make a profound difference um, if organizations are really wanting to maximize their individual contributors and and really as we take a long-term view we know that this group of folk coming to work uh, are going to have some expectations by sort of starting on the front line and what they hope will happen and the experiences they'll get a chance to, to have we have a chance with the material that we've created um, to help organizations, to help uh, talent managers, to, to help any, any thoughtful leader really in an organization, a small organization, maybe they don't have a talent manager, but there's someone in the organization who knows that they need to be paying attention to individual contributors. 
uh, our library gives you a chance to help folks understand the key roles that are essential to be successful. Uh, we, in the work that Bob Eichinger and I did, as we developed uh, the libraries, we realized in all, all of the libraries that we created that there were various domains within each of the libraries and, and the domains have uh, it, it provide a way of organizing the practices and i'll say a little more about that in a minute um, our 27 practices again as i suggested earlier will vary in importance depending on the powerful nature of a particular role inside of an enterprise as well as what the business plan may be for that particular entity so when we, when we got into looking at, well, what is it that individual contributors must fulfill in order to be successful and to feel that their work is making the contribution that, that they certainly would like to make, um, we came to these particular roles. And we've tested this out, by the way, in a variety of organizations. And we've gotten very, very good feedback around each and every one of these roles and how these roles in fact play out well one of the things that that we know is as i said a moment ago each role has different practices associated with that role what you see on the screen now are the practices that i've now listed in the order of developmental challenge in other words not all practices are equally difficult or equally easy to learn and to, and to uh, if you will, deliver. Um, so uh, understanding and relating to customers is the most difficult um, practice for individual contributors typically to master that's associated with getting things done. It's, the, it's one of those roles, getting things done um, that you can achieve more effectively if, in fact, you understand and relate to customers well, because individual contributors are typically on the front line. Right next to it is delivering consistent, high-quality results. And when we think about the role of getting things done, the high-quality results is clearly an expectation, uh, and the behaviors that go with that um, are important in order for a high potential to be recognized and given the proper uh, acknowledgement for the work that they've done. Persevering, the individual contributors often are in the middle of a whole bunch of storms in organizational life, whether it's vendor-related conflict or um, dealing with customer-related issues, and you have to persevere through those in order to be successful. Well, it certainly makes good sense that understanding goals, tasks, and plans, and setting work priorities would be associated with getting things done. My point being is that every single one of the roles um, has a series of practices that we know are related to those roles, and each of the practices have a different level of developmental difficulty um, that has to be attended to if a person's going to be effective in that practice and obviously fulfill that role. In our system, we have cards for every single role and every single practice. And in this particular example, since un relating, uh, understanding and relating to customers was the one I identified in getting things done that was the most difficult to learn. We have a narrative that sort of gives the frame of reference for why this practice is important and then some very specific behaviors um, to help guide a person to, in fact, uh, understand what she or he needs to do in order to fulfill the practice of understanding and relating to customers, which is essentially associated with getting things done. Now, I mentioned earlier that our uh, practices are organized into various uh, domains. Uh, when we did this, we uh, looked at the practices around managing self, uh, which every individual contributor needs to keep on the radar, uh, what it is uh, to do the work, 
uh, what are the particular kinds of behaviors and practices essential to doing the work. And we've had any number of executives tell us that this particular domain is one that they really like to prioritize because uh, having people understand uh, how important it is to deliver the high quality results is manifest in doing the work. Of course, relating to others is an increasingly uh, bigger deal uh, because we are finding that as people come into the workplace, uh, the interpersonal skills that would have been learned in various other settings have been changed. The settings have been changed and some of the lessons learned around relating to others hasn't been as successful. Uh, if you've been to a, an institution of higher learning and you lived in a private room all of your college career, you didn't have the same lessons of relating to others as the person who lived in a room with another person or two other people in some cases. So there are some relating to others practices that we know and certainly independent evidence has shown us that increasingly this area um, in the workplace has become very important. And of course, uh, being very intentional about helping individual contributors develop a career um, is a part of the story that we want individual contributors to hear that you're you're a part of an enterprise you're a part of an organization and we're committed to uh, you being successful in that particular entity so when we um, take a look at well gosh here are practices and here are things that um, are very important to achieve uh, to, to get done, the natural question is, well, what are the kinds of experiences that a person needs in order to, to do that? And so what we have done in all of our libraries is that we've taken the, the, what Bob and I have considered the 21 main experiences in which a person can learn a great deal and we've coded the practices across those experiences. Um, I'm sure all of you here today are aware of the 70 20 10. And then I put a, a backslash to the 25, the 70 20 10, meaning 70% of the learning is in the experience, 20% is usually with um, um, a relationship such as a mentor or a boss, and 10% classroom or independent. Uh, e-learning or uh, some such uh, experience where you often they're doing it yourself and the 25 percent relates to uh, typically hardships of some form <clears throat> that a person's experienced that's that's given them a lot of lessons well when we coded the various practices and and i've only listed the the, the one of the what we call a five codes there's several five codes with each and every practice. There are four, three, two, and one. By that meaning that the experience is going to contribute to understanding this practice in, in deeper detail. And that the practice is a central part of what the experience is. So you see in green on the screen that, for example, understanding and relating to customers, you, you will learn more about that by having an external representative role in the organization. Delivering consistent high quality results whenever you can have a, an opportunity to generally manage a project or be responsible for uh, the soup to nuts of a particular activity, uh, you, you will learn the kinds of things that are essential to deliver high quality results and so forth. So you see, but within our system and in our libraries, we have said, well, look, let's zero in on, and as I said when I started this, surgically what's really important for individual contributors. Well, there are 10 roles that we know are vital. Within those 10 roles, there are various practices that are essential to drive those roles. And in order to do those particular practices well, we know that there's some experiences we can assign people uh, from which they are likely to learn the kinds of things that will enable them uh, to do that practice uh, quite well. 
one of the things that <clears throat> while we're on this particular topic um, and since we're in the middle of the COVID crisis, I would just mention that Bob and I have done two special webinars taking a look at uh, the VUCA process that we're all trying to learn to manage more effectively. And when it comes to taking a look at uh, what we did and identifying uh, learning experiences, we, we already included uh, pressure and crisis experiences where you have a role and a responsibility to help deal with a pressure crisis moment in an enterprise. And we coded those with the practices with individual contributors. And so um, what uh, you should see, you should see a slide that does not appear to be popping up for reasons I can't quite explain, but um, what the slide that you should see uh, is that, in fact, we identified developing resilience and resourcefulness and managing conflict as the two most important practices for individual contributors who were thrown into a, uh, a crisis moment and are expected to be a part of the solution in an enterprise for dealing with pressure and crisis circumstances. Well, one of the things I've tried to suggest to you throughout this and throughout this entire uh, conversation, in this case around individual contributors, is that uh, we, we have looked for multiple data sources to make sure that what we give you is the most evidence-based perspective to help you either coach or facilitate or if you're responsible for um, the talent processes in an organization to make sure that you're focusing on those things that will make uh, the biggest difference. Now, you know us, you know that we think that uh, getting to the specifics of what's important in your entity, your organization is very important. So using the cards to that we have for every single library, but in this case, individual contributors using the cards to create a profile that says in our organization, these are the practices that are mission critical for us right now, or perhaps mission critical for the next year business plan. And how do we then uh, effectively identify where we are uh, within that profile? What are our peaks and valleys and what do we need to make sure and nurture within our individual contributors for them to be as successful. Now, I want to mention in passing, in all of our material and all of our uh, items from our Develop It Yourself guides to our interview guides for individual contributors, we, we have some brain tips embedded in the material. We like to um, think about, well, what are some things to be mindful of? And this is just a, a very high level summary to say, we know that our neurology plays a part in our learning. And we know that we come packaged with some pre-programs and how we activate those programs to help a person learn. Um, we've attempted to tap into those and give some various tips in the materials that we've created. With our 360s to help individual contributors get a handle on what are, how am I doing on these roles and how am I doing on the practices that matter? Um, we have a, a variety of reports that come from the 360 experience. It could be a comprehensive detail report or a simple placemat report that shows the top and the middle and the bottom uh, ratings uh, uh, for a particular person um, to help them zero in on and then if need be go in to develop it yourself to find the tips and suggestions for how you might uh, fix or enhance a particular practice or skill. In my way of thinking we try to help you align what are the practices that are essential in your context, assess what are the perceived strengths or gaps uh, for the group that you have as well as the individuals. Uh, using our analytical and diagnostic maps uh, that we have, you can identify you know, what are the kinds of things that are critical to pay attention to, how to um, assign the right kinds of uh, tasks 
uh, what kinds of things a coach or a mentor should focus on to help the individual contributor uh, be successful. And of course, the, vit the vitally important task of monitoring um, what's happening for individual contributors uh, is aided with having accurate data. <clears throat> so we have a whole set of materials to help those who are in that space to work with individual contributors. And we feel uh, quite good about how we've zeroed in on the behaviors that matter at each level of organizational life. And in this particular case, uh, taking a look at individual contributors and the attention they need in order for them to be successful. We have five libraries. Uh, in addition to our individual contributor library, um, we have a, a, a high potential performance library and teams library. I'll be doing some webinars on those in the future to talk about what those look like and how those can be used to make sure that, in fact, uh, you, you're getting the most current evidence-based material uh, that we know and have available to help with whatever the pain point is in your particular uh, organization or in the role that you're providing as a coach or a, a, a consultant um, in helping organizations be successful. Well, it is my firm belief that uh, we have provided for folks who are really serious about helping individual contributors um, the, the first sort of cogent a comprehensive look at what are the roles and practices that individual contributors need to develop in order to be successful. And we think that uh, based on the feedback we're getting so far, um, that in fact, we've <clears throat> hit a home run with those. One of our clients uh, used the, the individual contributor library, Kasai, with 190,000 individual contributors. It's a worldwide company and all of the feedback has been uh, spectacularly uh, useful in terms of how it's helped them have a common language to understand their roles and responsibilities and how the, the measures of engagement, for example, have shown uh, an increase which they attribute to uh, using the Kasai material for the enterprise that helped uh, focus on those things and gave the attention to the kinds of uh, attributes and the behaviors critical for individual contributors to be successful. So if you have questions, by all means, uh, please um, ask those. You can put them in the chat space and or um, you can unmute yourself and ask and I'm happy to uh, have you do that. You can also send me questions uh, easily at pyramid at teamintelligent.com and I'll respond to those uh, as uh, soon as I can. So uh, if you haven't visited our website, please do so. And just know that uh, we are in a variety of strategies. We're using the social media to get our message out. We'd be happy for you to do so as well. <clears throat>